Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Graham, for getting us off to uh, such a good start <laughs> and uh, for hosting us today. Um, I'm Denise Shevin, and uh, I'm going to be chairing uh, today's event. And uh, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of Construction Manager and BIM Plus, um, welcome you to the Digital Construction Summit 2019. It's absolutely fantastic to uh, see such a packed house. I think we're standing room only uh, for our uh, first event. And uh, we have a brilliant uh, lineup of speakers <coughs> for you today. Before we start, though, uh, I'd like to say some words of thanks and also mention a few points of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say uh, some, uh, a big thanks to our event partners and sponsors. Uh, they are CIOB, CITB, CADS, Ed Controls and Zutech, and of course, uh, Pince Masons, who I, as I mentioned are hosting us today in these uh, fantastic facilities. Uh, you can find out more about these companies during the day. Uh, you can visit our exhibition stands in the networking area during the coffee and lunch breaks. Please uh, do that. That would be to find out some really interesting stuff. Um, I'm sure you'll be uh, very familiar with uh, Slido. Uh, we'll be using it uh, today as an interactive feature. Uh, so please uh, do join us using your smartphones. Uh, the code is uh, now on screen. Uh, there we go. Um, if you just enter, uh, once you have the Wi-Fi, if you visit the URL uh, and then enter the access code, which is uh, there, um, some of our speakers will actually be using Slido to ask you questions. So if you can get that set up, that'd be great. Uh, but whilst you're doing that, just a gentle reminder, please, to keep your phones on silent. Uh, I'm sure that's an easy thing to do these days. We are aiming to make uh, the event as interactive as possible. Uh, so we're hoping uh, there'll be time for lots of questions. Uh, feel uh, free, please, to ask questions after the speakers have finished. And if you just put your hand up, uh, one of our organisers uh, will be around with a microphone. And if you could say your name and where you're from, uh, that would also be great. Uh, you can uh, tweet uh, uh, during the day, and we would encourage it. The hashtag uh, is up there. And... Uh, Keep those comments coming. Hopefully you've all got that. So uh, now uh, time is short, so I'm going to get quickly on uh, to our first session of the day. And our first speaker is ACOM's David Philp, who'll be uh, also chairing a panel session on the latest BIM and digital thinking and uh, talking about the work of CIOB uh, Digital Special Interest Group. Uh, joining uh, David, uh, we have a great line of panellists. Uh, they are uh, Neil Thompson uh, from Atkins, SN uh, Lavalley, uh, Roy Evans from the Government Property Agency, uh, Dr. Jennifer MacDonald from PCSG, uh, Dr. Noah Salib from Middlesex University, and James Daniel from Skanska. So there are a fantastic lineup of panellists. So over to you, David, please. Thank you very much. Denise, thank you. And thank you, colleagues, for coming along today for our, our session. Uh, as Noah said, I'm David Phil. My day job is at ACOM, where I'm Global uh, Cons Consultancy Director for BIM and Information Management. But today, I'm actually here on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Building, where I'm a trustee. And as Denise said, chairing a special interest group as well. And we're really lucky today to be joined by, we have a special interest group for digital technologies and asset management. We'll fuse the two of them together. So you'll hear from the panel shortly. And as Denise said, if you can submit any <coughs> questions in advance. What we're going to do is I'm going to give a short presentation, just about an overview 
to frame some of the key observations that we are seeing within this digital space. You'll hear some short vignettes from each of the panelists, and then we'll get on to a question and answer session uh, from yourselves. But it, and we think it's a really interesting time. You know, in terms of the CIB special interest group, it's sort of morphosized from what was a BIM group into a much wider digital technologies and think more about what it means in the world of the whole life cycle and asset management. <laughs> and I think what we're observing is we're starting to see our built environment starting to bargain a completely new relationship with how it uses technology and how we use data as well. We're seeing constructs such as building information modeling, information management landscapes becoming a central plank in how we design and how we construct or more assemble and how we operate our assets now. So we're seeing a profound, if not exponential, changes in our industry. So what are we doing at the CIOB? Well, hopefully everybody knows about the Chartered Institute of Building, but it's the largest global profession for construction management. Well, for the Royal Charter since the year of 1834, and again, we're trying to advance the science of, of our built environment within there, and not just our physical built environment, <coughs> but also our digital built environment, hence forming a special interest group. And we're looking in terms of you know, how we fuse technology and innovation together, how we use our data to give real value within there. And it is about the science and practice of construction. But increasingly, we have to involve people from asset management as well. And actually, it's interesting if you look at diversity of our special interest group, not just in terms of gender, but actually across the globe. We've got members in Russia. We've got members of our special interest group uh, in China. Again, all looking at the same theme. So it's really in terms of what we're doing. We're trying to reimagine that whole construction process as well. And the big part, we're trying to make it practical, especially to members that may work as construction managers and developing that roadmap as well. Some of the things that are done at a real practical level, if you go onto the CIB site, you can see in terms of mindful security, we're creating huge amounts of information, but how do we manage it securely? Becoming conscious of what we're doing within there. And I think the big thing we're seeing within our special interest group is actually how Technology is changing our institutes within there. I'm sure many of you read this book as well, but we're going through a period of real change, a profound change in terms of our professions. Not just in terms of technologies for design, construct, but increasingly through feedback loops, how we can get better investment within there. Making a huge impact, especially in terms of education and training. I think as well as we go forward, actually, contractual arrangements as well. So we are trying to answer these questions just now. So it's a real interesting time, we believe, for institutes and indeed our industry as a whole, and actually what impact is technology going to make within there. And I'm sure one of the things you'll see on the right-hand side is the impact of design for manufacturing assembly. There's actually a real convergence of themes coming together. If you haven't been, that's the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre just outside Glasgow. And again, showing how technology, robotics are coming there. As you heard from Graham, actually trying to answer one big question, the productivity question, that no matter what part of our city you go to, how can we use technology and data to try and improve that world of uh, better productivity. Well, what does key drivers look like in a digital built environment? We're trying to have a look at them ourselves. And across our membership, we're probably seeing four. Number one is policy alignment. And again, right across what was policy in terms of BIM is becoming much more in terms of thinking about data and transformation, how we start to think about advancing our technologies. And you see down the bottom left, I think advanced industrialization is key. So again, not just data that's flowing into models for coordination, but how do we start to get them into robotics? And again, how do we start to use them for productivity as well? We're seeing much more policy alignment. And as we start to exploit the data, how we can move it into DFMA, or as we've seen from UK government, the platform design manufacturer. Start to think about standard chassis as well. On the right-hand side, you know, higher performing built assets. And I think you know, that's a real goal within there as well. You will go on from a period of, I think, better outcome, but actually how do we get better uh, outputs to actual outcomes? So actually how do we use this data, be, data for better service provision? Actually start to think about not just coordination, but actually how can we use it for clinical excellence within there as well, for an example. And I think that one of the biggest challenges we've all got is the backdrop of how do we start to get better performing assets in terms of the carbon agenda and sustainability. How do we think about carbon performance over that whole life cycle? How do you use data analytics within there as well? And again, we're seeing this driven by across the globe, you know, government targets. You know, the public sector wants change to happen and putting real targets which are driving these changes within there. So we see that digital built environment is really starting to change with key drivers across there as well. I think at the heart of it as well is, you know, the real innovation will happen when we actually change 
the model, the commercial model around about this as well, moving from a world of capital expenditure where we can actually start to move into a world of service provision and actually start to think about how we can use data that's looking at demand in real time and how we can start to think about how we work our assets better. Not just new project investments, but increasingly the assets and retain the state we already have. And probably the next big thing we're seeing in terms of our working group is that world of moving from the digital models to the digital twin, you know, moving from that digital representation to actually connecting it with the physical world as well. And this is a quote from the centre of a digital built Britain. Actually, one of the key things that could distinguish a digital twin from any other digital model is connectivity within there. Starting to think about the constructs of Industry 4.0 in terms of what they look like. This is some of our own thinking. You know, number one on the left-hand side, you have that digital representation. And what we're seeing over the last couple of years, that actually we've got quite good at it, building structured models that are data-rich, that are secure, and they're collaborative. So the work we've been doing over the last couple of years, hugely important, get an accurate digital twin. The next big part comes, the physical twin. You know, how do we connect the two of them together? And the big thing we're seeing now is, you know, we're having to work, again, in terms of other technology vendors, pervasive sensing, IoT, how do we make sure we are getting, if you like, data acquisition from our built assets as well within that physical twin within there? And I think the key challenge as well, and I think this is an education one as well, is thinking about analy analytics and simulation. How do we start to analyse huge amounts of data? How do we simulate in terms of scenario planning to optimise as well within there? And I think hopefully one of the key things that will come out of today is that digital thread of data. How can we constantly move it from the world of like the digital twin to the physical twin? That always on sharing data as well. But right at the heart of it is actually having a good quality information model. So that's a real foundation in what we're trying to do as well with it. There. We can't lose that part of it as well. We get it right. You know, it starts to give us real value in terms of predictive insight, optimization in terms of operational strategies. I think the other big one is investment strategies as well within there. And the goal of it, well, transformative operational outcomes. We all know that's where the, the big prizes were there as well within there. And ultimately, we want to get a better user experience. It might be data acquisition now. I know some of our colleagues on the thing, we actually share a data. It might be physical activity. Just for reference, it's usually me that's winning, but uh, that's something else up there. But actually, how do we get better experience for there? Yes. And the big part of that is trying to build that feedback loop within there as well. That's some of the key challenges that we're working on. We see it within there, but again, we're trying to give practical advice for a special interest group to membership. As we move forward, what does that strategy start to look like as well within there? Because we now know that data has real value for not just construction, but that wider built environment. And probably the challenge now is how we actually explore it cross sector, how we can benchmark data from project to project to actually start to get real improvement, especially in terms of the productivity agenda. So a bit of final graph of what we're seeing, you know, you, you know, take the along the bottom, you know, this may move within there, but you can see along the, the y-axis, built infrastructure performance within there. And I think what we've seen over the last couple of years, we're thinking about the digital agenda at a project level. But what we are starting to see is now is people thinking about the digital estate. How do I digitize what I've already got? So I think much more about data capture within there as well, photogrammetry, LIDAR, AI algorithms to start to capture it as well. And we're starting to see all these different themes start to come together as well, from geospatial, BIM, edge analytics, all these things. And the question would be, if you left BIM to go natural growth, what does that start to look like? Well, natural adoption, but you start to bring all these things together through convergence. Well, we start to see things happening. Design automation, design for manufacturing assembly, process transformation, and back to what Graham said, actually productivity. But probably the key thing for us is that built asset performance. And actually, there's a the goal. How do we achieve <coughs> high performing built assets using these technologies and using data as well? As a special interest group in the CIOB, that's what we're trying to work with others to try and solve the agenda as well. Because it gives us new procurement models. We move from something that's reactive to where we are now, which maybe is deterministic, to moving forward to something much more probabilistic as well within there, where we've got insight, and actually move to transformative in terms of and new models for the built environment. So a real exciting time within there as well. So you've heard from me. What we're going to do now is hand across to our panel. You'll hear first from Neil, who's going to give you a short vignette in terms of some of the key themes from what they're doing with the special interest group and what they're seeing within their day job 
within the industry as well. So Neil, can I first hand over to yourself just to hear some thoughts and insights? Sure, just to check, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so my name is Neil Thompson, I'm Director of Digital Construction <coughs> at Atkins, and I suppose I've, got, I've aligned my focus with both my organisation and the special interest group. So I currently lead the, well, finishing off leading the creation of our capability around robotics and um, one of the fortunate things about my role, I've managed to be traveling around the world looking at different types of manufacturing techniques with robotics, but also the manufacturing of the robots themselves. And an interesting thing has happened in the past couple of years is that the price of a particular type of robot called cobots, collaborative robots, are reaching what I call consumer prices. So they're, you know, they're gonna be looking at around 5,000 pounds to buy uh, an arm that's probably about this big, um, relatively straightforward to program and uh, creates an interesting dynamic for us in construction because what tends to happen with investment in robotics in our sector is that we think about, let's create a new tunnel boring machine, let's create a machine that can 3D print houses, let's create in sort of in what are called industrial <coughs> level robotics with cooker arms and things that are relatively quite dangerous to operate around outside the field. So with, um, I, I guess the, the point of view that we've got here and the connection back to the CIOB is instead of looking at robotics as uh, an, in, an industrial practice that happens um, to displace people, what happens when you look at robotics from the point of view of um, the natural progression from the screwdriver to the power drill to the cobalt arm where you're augmenting the capabilities of the skilled labor in that robotic sphere. So uh, an interesting thing that we've been doing on um, an operational level in the nuclear sector is applying it in, in that way. So how do you get to the operative level and say, well, what are you doing things on a task by task level? So you're not looking at somebody's role in automating it. You look at the subtasks within those roles and applying robotics to that space. So we're you know, taking people out of harm's way in the nuclear decommissioning process. You know, previous proposals around that type of work cost in the order of five to 10 million pounds and you have to go to Innovate UK or some other government agency to look for investment at that level to make it applicable because it's relatively dangerous. But you know, getting that price down to tens of thousands of pounds creates a different dynamic. So I guess a, a message for me is things that were once expensive to implement things like robotics have now become quite cheap. And what does that mean in terms of implementation if it's costs in the region of tens of thousands of pounds? Thank you, Neil. If we can hand over to, to Roy, Roy's going to give us a view actually from, you know, what does it actually mean to a client in terms of this world of digitization, right? Yeah, so in terms of the, the client perspective, really, I think that clients really need to think about purchasing and actually we're, we're no longer, and this is a challenge for you in terms of engagement with clients, you're no longer purchasing just a building, you're purchasing the information that's associated with that. So in terms of clients and moving into a digital area, it looks at the skills and what skills, gaps and capabilities that they've got in place and they need to think about that. And they need to think that actually, as well as buying data, they're starting to put themselves um, in terms of the information and the power of the information through a bit of a change management process. So this has a, a significant impact on how organisations and client organisations work and approach um, projects and uh, their delivery. But also, in terms of the supply chain, it's about making sure that with the supply chain, we bring them on the journey as well. And that also, in terms of clients, that they've got the capability and expertise to engage appropriately with the supply chain, but also with the consultants who are advising them and professional advisors. And particularly in terms of CIOB and in terms of members and their capability, they're the real key bit in terms of this whole process, in terms of joining up the client's demands with actually what happens on site and what can be delivered through the delivery of a project and a programme. But two other aspects I think that clients really need to think about in terms of security, and this is in terms of the information that you've got, it's digital, as soon as it gets out there, it's out there and it can remain, go to um, all sorts of uh, variety of places. But also it's about thinking about the um, pragmatism that you need to approach with security. And so in terms of being pragmatic and not being afraid to challenge your security advisors as well. But also making sure that in terms of contracts, that early on you start thinking about issues such as security, where information goes, where it's stored, and how we um, work with it. Finally, I think in terms of um, clients, we need to think about information. So let's start off with the end in mind, who needs what information at what phases, and also thinking about the 
packet report and in terms of making sure that information is searchable, not just from a project basis, but also from a portfolio basis as well. And um, I think really we need to understand that clients now need to move into a position where in terms of information and the requirements placed upon them will be that of being much more clear and much more definite, which I think is always to a fair degree, has been an appropriate challenge that's come from the supply chain to clients and their organisations. Roy, thank you. And if we can hand over now to, to Jennifer. Jennifer, you obviously, you, you, you've done a lot of work in terms of research and you've done working with industry. What are your sort of observations as to what you're seeing? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Jennifer McDonough from PCSG. Um, so what we are seeing is, um, well, similar to what my fellow panellists are seeing, is um, as we're starting to move towards the digital twin and we're starting to handle very large data sets now, um, I think in the past there's been a bit of a focus on trying to push clients into um, buying whole new platforms or systems and making sure all their data is in structured form and so on. But I think now we're actually moving towards trying to utilise the data that we've got. So how do we help clients take their existing legacy systems, their data that's in multiple different formats and sources, and how can we help them aggregate all that data and start to get new insights into it? So, um, so we've actually developed our own platform, um, GeoConnect Plus, to actually bring together multiple data sets um, from lots of different sources. Um, a lot of it's unstructured and, and to be able to get insights into that. I think some of our competitors are, are moving into this space as well. So I think that's, that's a big change that's happening at the moment. Um, along with that is obviously the education training side, which is my interest and in, in no has. Um, so how do, how do we get keen graduates in to, to work with us? How can we be more agile? How can we help universities to be more agile as well in the way that they're teaching? Um, so that's an interest of, of mine and, and the companies as well. So, um, so we're trying to look at ways of how we can actually start to get research coming through the universities and out to market quicker. How can we spot graduates that um, might be able to drive the industry forward? Um, and uh, also, sort of, I guess, a change in, in different types of um, skill that we need in construction as well. So um, we're, we're all employing more data scientists, data analysts. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be a big change in how we all work uh, over the next few years. Thank you. So new skills, new roles. No, no ha, in your role in terms of you know working in terms of academia, in terms of use of creative technologies in construction, are you seeing this coming through as well? Are we adapting fast enough? Um, thank you, Dave. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, um, but going on from uh, what Jennifer said as well, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we identified as well within the group and within the university is how to upskill the professionals in the industry and how to, when to start earlier on at undergraduate level and postgraduate level. And uh, one of the things that we've identified is with moving on to these new technologies era and uh, all the skill sets that are needed, we cannot just rely on the traditional method of just um, implementing or teaching the, the, the professionals or students or whoever comes into the industry just the technical skills or how to do it. Uh, it's just not one skill. There are seven other identified skills which are really important. So, for example, uh, in addition to the technical ones, how do you implement the uh, operational skills uh, as well? How do you manage that within the teams? Another skill is the uh, strategic implementation of uh, the way forward, how to create a strategy plan to improve the business, to implement these opportunities. Another one is the mindset. How do you change the mindset of the individual in order to uh, start thinking of new opportunities to bring into the business? Uh, another one is entrepreneurial skills. This is one of the things which is not concentrated on at all within academia. And I do confess that it's one of the things that we're trying to implement at undergraduate and postgraduate level as well. Um, how to think about new innovative uh, solutions. Uh, there is also the um, long life hunger for learning. That is something that a lot of people do not think about once they just get the position or just go to the title. So these are some of the issues, the challenges that we're trying to um, see what the industry needs in order to implement in academia, uh, to have someone who has proper skill sets for using these types of new technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. James, you know, you obviously you're working in the world of main contracting, infrastructure. Are you starting to see these changes coming through? Or are you actually starting to use technologies to make these changes? Yes, what they said. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to start my bit with a couple of um, couple of figures just to represent what we do in, in, in Scranska. So um, in infrastructure services, we look after 14,000 structures. Uh, we look after 270,000 streetlights, 42,000 kilometers of highway network and 400 kilometers of tunnels. There's a lot of information inside those assets and that's just 14% of the highway network that we look after. We're one of many contractors that has responsibilities across our network in the UK. Um, you cannot feasibly deliver suitable service delivery objectives to your clients using pen and paper, not anymore. And everything that my colleagues have said this morning in terms of understanding how to use tools like robotics uh, for better delivery, understanding how to encourage entrepreneurialism and training and upskilling the right people at the right time are vital to the success that we have in the industry as we, as we stand at the moment. Um, within Skanska, uh, we have to use technology. Our, our reach across the UK with just my part of the business is from Ipswich to Exeter, and we cannot effectively rely on traditional methods of communication to ensure that we have the right information at the right time. We look after contracts where the client, in my opinion, is sometimes more advanced than we are in terms of understanding what their asset data is doing, and they expect more from us. On the flip side, we have other clients who want our guidance in terms of what to do with their assets and their data. And having digital tool sets like uh, GIS tools for mobile workforce management, deploying um, work orders to, to gangs out and, on sites and networks is vital to make sure that we deliver the right information at the right time. What that does for us is when it comes back into the business, is we can make informed decisions about our business direction, about how we support our clients effectively going forward. If we do two or three extra potholes of repair, pothole repairs a day, you could safely add a million pounds a year to the bottom line of some of our activities. When you start applying simple processes with figures like that, you start to see the tangible benefits that we can deliver to our clients. Giving people the tools are vital. Um, everything that we've spoken about here so far this morning is, is, is critical. And we're not the only contractors doing this. You know, there are other contractors and there are other consultants and we're working hand in hand to understand that what we are doing is not in isolation. And we can't do it in isolation because if we do that, we won't just have digital twins, we'll have digital triplets. And that's going to cause a nightmare for everybody. James, thank you. Thank you to our panel. So I should also say we've got another 12 you know, SIG members you know, across the globe as well. So, but I think everyone we've heard today in terms of robotic cells, advanced industrialization, intelligent client data integration, and as James mentioned there, you know, in terms of running, you know, huge networks, how we use data. And as Noah said, you know, new skills required and new knowledge as well that are coming in. This is a big part of what we're trying to do as well. So you've heard from us. We'd like now to get any questions from yourself. So if you can put your hand up and if you can say who you're from and if there's anyone in the panelists you'd like to actually put a question to as well. So please, watching for any hands coming up. John, there's a microphone working its way around you just now. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, John Adams from Gladabim. Interesting comment about structured data not being the only way forward now. Is it true to say that we need structured and unstructured data for the long time yet, or do you see the end of structured data being really necessary in the, in the near future? Um, I think they're both um, going to be used for a long time. So um, yeah, it's a mixture at the moment, I think. But, um, but I think it's going to be increasingly into the large unstructured sets. And how can we bring that together, cleanse it, make sure that it's in a format that's useful as well, and that we can get insights into it? Um, I don't think going to be throwing out one or the other. Noah, can I build upon that? Are you starting to see in terms of the courses coming through as data science becoming a key element of it? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, increasingly, new courses are beginning to incorporate a computer science aspect, so programming, uh, understanding um, object-oriented programming, how to create simple routines. It's really important for students to start understanding that side of things. Uh, it's, it's essential now in the work of the way. So yes, this is coming into the new courses. Neil, is our relationship in terms of now working cyber physical with advanced robotics, are you trying to, are you seeing different in terms of how we think about data, how it flows through into our robotic friends? Yeah, I think um, an interesting dynamic. So obviously there's a level of complexity that's high in the robotics world. So you think of the way that we design today uh, is essentially centered around giving people instructions on how to do things on a building site. 
to be able to achieve that with the support of robotics is a completely different kettle of fish. But I think the interesting thing that's happening is um, the realm of robotics has sort of been stuck in the manufacturing and academic world because of the level of um, expertise required. You know, if we look at using mainframe computers a long time ago, you know, men in tweed jackets and bow ties, PhDs, big room, and now anybody can use them. Um, and we, we're reaching that. The, the level of complexity of programming them is, is, is reduced. But I think the, the thing that we'll rub against is the, the culture that we've created around how we give things instructions. As I say, it, it's still embedded in giving people paper instructions on the site. So it's, it's interesting. Roy, I mean, you know, huge amount of data now for clients to curate, mm -hmm. you know, long term now, not just in terms of a project, but in terms of digital estates within there, as Jennifer said, not just the structured schemas such as Kobe and such like, but now things that are coming in from, you know, sensing data. Are clients ready, do you think, in terms of being able to manage all this data sets? Probably not. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> I think in terms of um, data sets and information, I think there's two challenges for clients principally. One is really to understand what information they've got, where it sits, who needs it, at what time and in what format. And I think that's still a big ch challenge for, for clients to really understand that because this is the information that we get from assets goes across the whole organisation. Um, so we've got to understand that. But then I think the next challenge around the client side is actually making sure that that information is of an appropriate quality and secondly, quality standards for that are absolutely critical because decisions, that, you know, particularly at senior levels in um, organisations, are just made around information and data. And if you get that wrong, then actually you start to drive a whole series of problems. So understanding that quality, I think, is key. James, from your point of view, you talk about all the infrastructure you provide. Is that starting to become smart? Is it giving us a real-time feedback loop that yes. so desire? Yeah, we're seeing in the last six months the applications of technologies and processes have really given us a better insight into how we're, we're approaching our asset maintenance strategy. Um, a really good example is we're, we're, like many, delving into things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and I actually think it's an easy subject to apply when it comes to asset management and highways. You know, uh, one of my clients has a quarter of a million uh, water gullies, which are innocuous subjects at best, but the minute they block, flood, or cause blockages in highways, everyone suddenly grinds to a halt on the network. Um, we need to go out and repair those, maintain those, and, and make sure that they are in good, good working order on a regular basis. But the problem is, is I can't send 250,000 people to 250,000 assets every day of every week. I need to make sure they go to the right place at the right time. So we take all the historic data that we've got, we take other data sets like you know, environment agency data, weather data, traffic data, and we send the right people to the right place. And so far, we're getting results of 80 to 90% success rate in terms of what the machine is telling us where to do, where to go, and what to do. Uh, that technology at a basic level is just phenomenal. And that to me is a game changer. Thank you. Have we got Anna, any other questions at all? Question up there? I don't, it was just very quickly. Hi, uh, Alex Small from Tata Steel. Um, uh, Roy, music's my ears uh, in terms of trusted data. Um, do you see manufacturers linked databases? Um, managed linked structured databases linked into 3D models um, as a key solution to trusted data? I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this. Um, I think they're going to have to be and as we start moving down the, um, as we start getting much more into information rich environments, I think we need to put those links much more in place. But really, in terms of um, how that helps us, I think that's the key for it. And I'm sorry I'm struggling, because I, I feel as though I'm getting beyond some of my uh, expertise here. Neil, the role of the manufacturer, how is it important, is it, do you think, in terms of our digital journey in years yet from, you know, what does that look like in terms of, you know, connectivity now, with data dictionaries and such like? Uh, it's, it's, it's critical. It's, I, I suppose to pull an, an analogy from the music industry is the, the, the manufacturers are the artists to the Spotify platform, right? One of the things that we need to decide as an industry is that the data can sit wherever, but somebody's going to have to aggregate that and surface it to the appropriate people via some market platform. So I'm looking at some of the faces in this room, and there's, there's technologies that are working on those types of platforms. Um, and, you know, it's not just Spotify out there now. There's, there's competition there that, you know, it's the same instance of information in some cases. Um, 
but it's uh, yeah, it's. I think manufacturers need to become more mature to understand that having their data locked up on a hard drive in their office is not. It, it's better to find an appropriate level of uh, resolution to open up. Obviously, don't give all away your IP with you know highly detailed models with all the data, but you know the the, the output and outcome type information within your organisations need to be. Need to be shared, but yeah. So to take the old music analogy, EMI, early manufacturer engagement, could be the answer. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's my best joke of the day. I think we've got time for one last question. There was a hand across there. Which hand was it? Yep, you. Great. Um, so I just thank before, you. Just before you do that, if you can pull up the slide or just for the last part of the second. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Weaver, Weights Group. Um, as we become more and more reliant on the, the data that we use and decisions are made much earlier on in the process, I'm kind of curious to know how we're addressing sort of the checks and balances in the data we, that we use at the moment. Je Jennifer, you, you talk about data and data integration. What, you know, what do you see happening in terms of the world of data validation, ver verification, provenance? Is that something that's becoming a key driver now in the industry? Um, yes, I guess. Uh, I think as we're getting a bit smarter um, about the use of data and about um, them and awareness is growing, I think sort of automated ways of checking our data are going to become more and more popular. Um, but um, <laughs> sorry, not sure um, what else to say about that. Roy, do you want to build on that from a client perspective? You yeah, I, I think it's about really understanding um, early on in terms of level of detail and level of information that you need and making sure that that's reflected in the contract and in the EIRs. And this is also about educating the consultants that we've got as part of the process. And this education perhaps needs to come from the contracting side as much as anybody else, you know, in terms of making sure that we've got that right um, level of detail in at the right stage, but we've really got to get that really early on in the process as most of the initiatives in construction over the last 20 years have pointed to, is about early activity drives good results. Yeah. No, how is this something that's part of the uh, yes. agenda? Yes, I just want to add something here, that there is a big confusion sometimes in the industry between the difference between verification and validation, because in verification, whilst the information might seem right according to certain um, requirements or standards, it might not be usable, which is what validation is. And that's what brings on a bigger problem. Like, for example, if we're talking about robotics, like what Neil was talking about earlier, if we, and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, once we start automating these processes and the information looks right, what if an error happens because it is not usable? Who takes responsibility for that? So who takes the risk of that? If a robotic arm goes wrong or if something happens, is it the machine? Is it the programmer? Is it the company who's operating it? These are all part of the skill sets which must be taught or the people trained on in the industry. And it's one of the very, very essential skills that a company implementing these types of, of, uh, of technologies. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Noha. So thank you to our panelists. What we're going to do now is we'd like to ask you a question. We, we want our feedback loop as well within there. So we're going to stress test Slido, <laughs> hopefully. So hopefully on screen. Hopefully on screen. So you can see there... Not what I was expecting, but. Uh... <laughs> second question. Oh, okay. There's a yeah, second question. No, this wasn't our question, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call a plain language question, and we want to get a plain language question hopefully right. Ah, there we go. This is this is our one here sort of thing. This is we want to understand. We talked about you know the digital sig. And our asset manager with CIB, you know, we see taking members on a journey within there. So we want to understand where your digital journey currently is. So option A, you know, we're still getting the foundations in place. We're embedding BIM, information management, your key themes within there. Our second one was we're starting to make the incremental changes within there. We've got the basics, maybe business as usual. Third one, we're starting to move on to strategic digital transformation program, and we're starting to get integrated business systems. Or finally, Maybe you're at the point of you're very mature and your digital change program is starting to get optimized and disruptive outcomes. So we'd love to know where your vote, where you are within your digital journey. And a bit of honesty here would be fantastic. If they're Mark, I'm looking at you. Uh, 
within there. So please, if you could vote now. I think that's right. Is that 43 votes coming in? Good stuff, so we see that. Answers, perfect. Let's, let's give a go at that. Yep. Well, we got the respondents in the top corners. So yeah, yeah. Do we get a summary of results? Here we are. Ah, so this is. Oh, it's, 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 it's actually closer than I thought. So the, the top one is we have a digital transformation program and in integrated. So, so it's in terms of maturity, folk have moved away from the foundation. There is in place, obviously, you know, a program there that's much wider than just the BIM piece within there. But interestingly enough, just very close behind it is that need to get the foundation in place within there. And again, still folk are starting to get the, the, the changes incremental within there. It was interesting, CIB done a webinar last week with Autodesk. I think that was one of the key things that came out. You know, spend the time getting the basics right, move to incremental, and then transformative within there as well. And I think lastly, you know, we're still at the early days of this in terms of disruptive outcomes. But interesting enough, it just shows we are on the move from the basics to getting that if you like the, that strategic kind of within there as well and of course it just moved to get it there but you can see the top two very closely within there as well so thank you for listening to our panel just to recap if anything get the basics right you're the information management landscape doing it securely and collaboratively so important get your education right as well make sure you've got your own learning outcomes framework within there work with intelligent clients such as Roy and you know, think about in terms of what's the meaning <laughs> longer term in terms of productivity and advanced manufacture, as Jen said, what's it mean in terms of your own data unification within there. And as James said, we're now working with clients that you're thinking about how they're going to use data for optimization of operation. And please follow the CIB, you know, follow our digital seg, you know, we use some of our outputs as well. And if you're interested in our work, please see me after. So thank you and thank you to our panelists as well. <laughs>